Great time. Now, I am going to uh, hasten to the scripture today. Second Peter <clears throat> chapter number two is where we will, I'm sorry, Second Timothy. Man, what is this Second Peter? Why am I in Second Peter? Oh, yeah, I like that passage of scripture too. I'm just not preaching that today. Amen. But Second Timothy chapter number two is where we'll spend our time of preaching uh, today. And, you know, uh, we are in the month of August and Certainly, I uh, had anticipated Pastor Tracy Blackman to be preaching today. She had a family emergency and was not able to make the trip. And so our love goes to Pastor Tracy and her family. She said she would make it up to us uh, before the end of the year. So we'll keep folks uh, updated on that because I and we want to hear Pastor Tracy's ministry. Uh, and uh, so certainly appreciative of the opportunity to uh, stand here as always and uh, declare what I believe the scriptures um, are compelling us as God's people in this time and season. The month of August is considered Black August. Uh, it is a important month in the kind of um, memory of we who uh, love peace, justice, and liberation. Uh, Black August is not uh, the cousin or the kin to Black Thursday, amen, it is, or is it Black Friday? Black Friday, yes, we, we not uh, caught up in the commercialization, if you will, of all these um, particular days, but this is a day where we literally are reminding ourselves that there are those who are incarcerated, uh, some for legitimate reasons, others for illegitimate reasons uh, related to the law, if you will, but that there is this sense that we ought to never forget uh, those who are in jail and prison. Hebrews chapter number three um, declares that, that we ought to always remember those in jail. Uh, we are given that as an admonition, as a command. We who follow the ways of God are not to live our lives oblivious to this idea that there are those who are in prisons and jails uh, and they are languishing and they are in need of our continued vigilance, our continued advocacy, <clears throat> and our continued efforts to ensure that they are not forgotten. And then how many of you know that there are many of us who are not necessarily incarcerated in a jail cell, but we are still in jail? Hello, somebody. Amen. There are many of us who have a particular uh, series of, of life experiences, of, of, of traumas, of personal decisions, of decisions you did not necessarily appreciate or understand all of the ramifications and it has lingered and it has created for so many of us this sense that we are hemmed in and boxed in and are not able to literally rise from the limitation of our experience. And so this message today is a message that takes into account certainly this idea of Black August, but also I hope it serves as an admonition to all of us that we do not have to stay in the chains we are in in order to understand that freedom is within our grasp. Second Timothy chapter number two, this is one of the letters of the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Paul wrote this letter literally while he was in jail. This is a jailhouse letter. Somebody say amen. Uh, as a matter of fact, much of our biblical texts, uh, particularly in the Christian scriptures, the New Testament, as we often refer to it in uh, the church, was written by individuals who literally had a record. Amen. Amen. It is uh, a point of fact that many of the followers of Jesus were all people who were convicted of a crime. Somebody say amen. If you look at some of the uh, patriarchs and matriarchs of the biblical text, they were often considered to be people who lived outside the law. Hello, somebody. I mean, I know some of y'all like, I don't know, Pastor. I, you know, I, I, I need to be a law-abiding citizen. 
<laughs> yeah, I want you to follow the laws when they are moral. This is what Dr. King says. He says that it is our duty, our moral duty, to disobey an unjust law. It is our moral duty to disobey an unjust law, which is to say that there are some moments in our lives where we must be compelled to not comply in order to be faithful to the call of peace, love, and justice in the world. And so uh, this letter to Timothy, written by uh, Paul, who is in jail, Timothy is one of Paul's mentees, one of Paul's appointees to a church often thought to be in Ephesus, a major cultural center of the Roman Empire. They are all dealing with levels of oppression, repression, and persecution. And Timothy is trying to figure out, Paul, when are you coming home? Because the brother's tired of doing his work under these conditions. And Paul's actual letter to Timothy is his farewell letter. He is realizing that it is likely he will die in jail or in and at the hands of the Roman Empire. And so he writes these words to Timothy, and I hope these words, as we uh, sit in the month of Black August, sit on us in a powerful way. This is what the scripture says, 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 1. You then, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Everybody repeat after me. Say, I'm graced for this. And what you have heard from me through many witnesses and trust to faithful people who will be able to teach others as well. Timothy is literally being challenged by his mentor, Paul, while Paul is in jail to appreciate that whatever state and assignment he is in, though it may be hard, he must operate with the assumption that God has given him enough grace for his assignment. Enough grace. What is grace? Grace is God's unearned, undeserved love and kindness. Also in the Greek, it also means gifts that God has given you, the charisms, the ability, sometimes supernaturally infused, to handle the assignment placed in your hands. Amen. That's not any of my first points, but I just feel like talking about that for a second. I hope you know that no matter what moment, season of life you're in, God has graced you for this season. That you are not over your head. You are not operating over your skis. As a matter of fact, God wants you to consistently remind yourself that whether you are on your job, in your relationship, in your own journey, your self-healing, your self-revelations, whatever it is, you are graced for the season of life you're in. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. We'll keep reading because, you know, I told you I only give you 15 minutes, but, you know, maybe I'll give you a good black church 15 minutes. Amen. Verse number three, share in suffering. Somebody say share in suffering. Share in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Verse number four, no one serving in the army, listen to this, gets entangled in everyday affairs. The soldier's aim is to please the enlisting officer. And in the case of an athlete, no one is crowned without competing according to the rules. It is the farmer who does the work who ought to have the first share of the crop. So think this over what I'm saying to you, for the Lord will give you understanding in all things. Verse number eight, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, a descendant of David. That is my gospel to, for which I suffered hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. Paul is saying, I don't want you to ever forget the messages that I've literally risked my life and my freedom to communicate to you, I'm so convinced by what I'm saying that even with the threat of death and or incarceration, I'm willing to be chained like a criminal so you can see the power of my conviction. Yeah. And Paul, he's a writer, you know. Paul's like, I'm not, I'm not going to be, you know, throwing in the towel because of a little bit of hardship. And I want you to be convinced by my conviction. 
that what I'm saying to you is something worth you building your life on. I love this next verse here. Uh, it says, because guess what? Even though I'm chained like a criminal, the word of God is not chained. Woo. Man, I, when I read that, I almost spoke in another tongue. I almost just wrote on the floor. I said, the word of God is not chained. What does that mean? Amen. Therefore, I endure everything. Somebody say endure everything. For the sake of the elect, the chosen ones, those people that God has placed in my care, I'm willing to go through all of it. For you, the elect, why? So that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk from the topic today, free them all. It's going to be the title of our message today, free them all. Bow your heads and let's pray. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our heart so we will not sin against you and send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray that the people of the Lord say amen. Now, uh, you know, this, this declaration, free them all, is literally one of the, the kind of slogans, the outcries of those who are constantly on the front lines demanding that political prisoners or individuals who have literally protested, resisted, some to the point of violence that they may describe as self-defense that has led to a certain kind of injury or even death uh, for those individuals they were fighting against, agents of the state, police officers, correction officers, and they literally have been languishing in jails and prisons, some for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And often, as we have unfortunately practiced in this country, when people are incarcerated, if you are not directly a family member of that person, we all tend to forget them and cause them to experience a double death, if you will. A death to their freedom, but also a death to their connection to relationships that are meaningful outside the bars of the jail. I'll never forget when I was a political prisoner a couple of times, you know, and thankfully I got out both times, but you know, one of the times I didn't think I was gonna get out. We, we obviously got arrested a couple times in Ferguson doing our, 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 you know, protest work there, trying to fight for justice for Michael Brown. But another time I got arrested protesting the death penalty. Washington, D.C., this was the last weekend of the Obama administration. And I got arrested. No, I'm sorry. This was on MLK Day, the day after. So this is the last day of the Obama administration. And we were protesting, I think, the day before Donald Trump was to get inaugurated. And we were told, we were at the Supreme Court, and they told us that if you go up too hot, if you go up, uh, let's say, 10 steps, you won't get arrested. But if you go up to the 11th step, then you are subject to arrest. And you know, they prepared all of us and told us that, you know, and I, I didn't plan to get arrested that day because I was trying to go home. You know, I was been gone a long time. I think I was gone three days. I didn't want to go see Sharice and the babies. And you know, that was a big point of contention. You know, don't be calling me from jail, talking about you arrested. We don't want to hear that. Come home, please, just come home. What do you like about getting arrested? I didn't like it. <laughs> but something inside of me just, this wouldn't let me follow these immoral laws. So I stepped up on the 11th step with a bunch of comrades holding a sign that said, end executions. And after about 10 minutes of warnings, amen, they came and they arrested us all and, and they took us into the U.S. Marshals or into the Supreme Court uh, 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 holding cells, which is under the, under the Supreme Court. You didn't know they have like a little mini jail under the Supreme Court. And so, you know, they made me take the shoestrings out of my shoe, and they had us chained to chairs. And, you know, whenever I get arrested, I always keep my mean mug on, you know, my Hunter's Point mean mug, you know, because I just want you to know you, 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 
you got, you got the wrong one today. I'm, I'm handcuffed to a chair talking about you got the wrong one. I guess I lost that fight. But what was most impactful about this is that rather than letting us go, which they normally do call a catch and release, they actually held us past the time of our ability to be processed, so we all had to spend a night in the Washington, D.C. main jail. And what was so traumatizing about this jail, other than the bugs that crawled up and down the walls incessantly all night that we had to kill with our shoestringless tennis shoes, or the vermin that were in our bed cells that we had to, like, you know, just close our eyes and just trust that we weren't going to be eaten alive by morning time and we were going to stand before the judge to hopefully be let go, was that the next day when we were literally shackled to be taken to the D.C. jail magistrate, we were set in cells with the general population of individuals in the Washington, D.C. area who were also arrested that night for various kinds of offenses. And as I sat in the jail cell with about 20 young men that I did not know, I began to just talk to them and ask them questions. Hey, why are you here? Why are you here? And after, you know, the third one, they was like, so who are you? Like, why are you asking us all? I was like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, Mike McBride I'm from California. I was here protesting death penalty. But I'm just curious why you all here. And it was so fascinating to me to learn that all of the individuals sharing that cell with me were there for offenses as simple as stealing food out of the hands of someone who came out of a restaurant. One guy was there for sleeping in a business corridor or business doorway, and he got arrested. The most uh, interesting story of a person who was arrested was an individual who uh, was literally in his own bathroom at his home, and he was, you know, puff, puff passing to himself, praise God. He was, you know, you know, smoking some marijuana or whatever he was smoking. And he locked himself in his bathroom and could not figure out how to get out. <laughs> and so he's literally locked in the bathroom. And after three hours, he just starts kicking his bathroom door to the point where it sounds this alarm to a neighbor. They call the police. And he says, simultaneously, as I kicked my door of the bathroom off its hinges, the police were rushing in, and they arrested me for property damage in my own apartment. And I said, really? He said, yeah, you know, Rev, and I'm going to miss my job. I'm not going to even go to work tomorrow because I'm in jail for being locked in the bathroom smoking marijuana. And I said, man, that's as bad as you getting fired on your day off, amen, like uh, they did on Friday. Somebody say amen, right? I remember the fear I had, though, when I stood before the judge. Why? Because my Ferguson case, it appeared to have not been uh, put in the system to have been dealt with. And so they were telling me I was going to be extradited to St. Louis on a bus. And I said to myself, whoo. I should have stayed on that 10th stair. (laughs) What is so fascinating about my experience and about so many folks who find themselves caught in the system of incarceration and criminalization, whether they are doing the right thing or by the law doing the wrong thing, is that the process of incarceration itself is a dehumanizing act. It is an act that is not intended to rehabilitate or to even create a a certain kind of, of, of remediation for your crimes, if you will. It is squarely an opportunity for punishment. And the punishment is often so psychologically and physically, uh, 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 destructive on the person incarcerated that it literally changes their physiological and mental constitution. We fought for some years to get rid of solitary confinement. Why? Because for decades, some individuals were locked in a cell and not able to see sunlight, 
to the point that if they had darker skin, melanated skin, their skin would literally turn shades lighter because they were devoid of sunlight. And part of what we and I have learned over time is that there are people who are only able to be treated this way because they are often forgotten by the larger population. And the question we must ask ourselves, as the scriptures have asked us to do, how will we remember those who are in jail? What will be our response to them while they are in jail? And what is our particular responsibility to all who find themselves caught in bondage and oppression as a result of the systems and even or their own personal foibles and decisions? The scripture is very powerful in giving you and I some admonitions that I think you ought to attend to if we are to be the most faithful to the gospel. The scripture says, again, Paul writing to Timothy from a jail cell says to him in verse number three, share in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, which is then to say, how are we compelled, listen, to share in the struggle and the suffering of others? That's my first point. How can we free them all? We must be willing to share in the suffering of those who are in jail. And I want you to keep asking yourself, where am I and we needed to ensure that those who are caught in the wicked cycle of criminalization, incarceration, and punishment, how can we say, how can we lean in? How can we ensure that we are able to literally share in their suffering and facilitate liberation? Now, for so many, there is this sense that, you know, to be a Christian, I don't really need to, you know, be totally preoccupied with these matters. Why? Because, you know, I'm just here to follow Jesus. Well, I want you to be reminded that Jesus was a criminal. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Jesus was a criminal. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I, sir, I serve a criminal today. Amen. I, 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 my, my, my Savior got a record. Amen. He, he wasn't just walking through life, you know, just doing everything that everybody. Sometimes Jesus looked at the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and he said, I know I'm not supposed to heal on this day. But guess what? Somebody need to be healed. Broke the law. Sometimes Jesus, you know, was supposed to give, you know, his taxes to the seat, to the government. Jesus said, you know what? I don't feel like doing that today. Sometimes Jesus was supposed to go into the temple and just participate. He went in the temple. He said, you know what? I got to clear this thing out today. I got to lay my hands. Try Jesus, not me. Well, they didn't know that Jesus, praise God. Jesus was like, try me and see on this day because we're going to shut the temple down. Jesus was someone who appreciated that the only time his rage got so hot where he literally decided to say no to the rules of his day was when it required him to share with the suffering of other people. And I wonder what has happened to the church when we are often calling for more police, jails, and prisons rather than trying to get closer to those who are literally suffering and so desperate that they're engaging in actions that put them and others in harm's way. I continue to be a bit in despair about how we are living in a city and a region where we have police officers who literally are being arrested and punished for consistently sending out racist, xenophobic, homophobic text messages yeah. among their, their, their crews and people trying to cover up for them while they ask to send more of these folks out into the community. I say to myself, are these the people we want to literally help enforce the law when they themselves can't keep the rule 
those of their own of uh, their own positions. Matter of fact, now we got, I was told, civil rights groups like the NAACP, at least in Oakland. Another pastor who we are all cool with calling for the CHP, which is one of the most deadly law enforcement agencies in the state, to come into Oakland. Why? Because we got some folk robbing and bipping each other. Now, I want you to understand, Pastor Mike's not an advocate for bipping. Well, that's the street name for robbing people. You'd be like, what's a bipping? It's all the stuff that happened on Lakeshore in our cars. You come out glass on that, you just rob you. I'm not an advocate for that, but I am saying to myself, what is the solution to people who are so desperate to rob others they perceive to be wealthy? After we have just gone through a global pandemic where literally millions of people have died. Some of these are their elders and their parents and their aunties and their uncles. Some of these folks were the folks they were living with. I was in a meeting and they told me that a 13, a 14, and a 15 year old were literally sleeping in a car outside of a church because their parents or grandparents died during COVID. And one of the boys is notoriously known for now robbing people. When he was caught, he said he had to do what he needed to do to make sure his little brothers had food. And we were in a meeting with the preachers and the preachers were more upset with him robbing people than they were with him sleeping outside of their church in a car. And I began to ask myself, is the best thing the church has to offer those who are bound in the, in the vestiges of poverty and the vestiges of desperation and the vestiges of jail cells, is the most we have to offer them is law and order? I mean, if we're going to have law and order, let's have law and order for the rich first. Why are we not upset about the violence that often comes from uh, the, the wealthy elites who literally rob this country of their taxes? And they storm off in some other country so we don't have the social net to make sure that the poor, the needy, and the desolate have food have housing and have clothes. Are not they looters? Lord, have mercy. But we're not mad with them. Some of us want to be them. <laughs> so it's like, oh, I can't wait till I become a billionaire. You ain't going to become no billionaire. I hate the bus Joe bubble. Tell your neighbor, you ain't going to become no billionaire. I'm not a hater. I ain't doing all past the mic up there hating. No, you, you're not going to become a billionaire. Why? Because that is reserved, the billionaire class, often for looters. Ooh, I wish I could talk to somebody. I was in a conversation with somebody, and they told me, uh, you know, well, you shouldn't be mad at the billionaire. They just work harder than everybody else. I said, do you really believe? <laughs> I said, do you really believe that a billionaire's wage that is 2,500 times that of the worker is about how much work they do? Say, so you must not know everyday people who work every day. I know them. They, they are often working 15 hours a day. They often, you know, they don't get vacations. They don't get private jets and yachts. There is no occupation in the world. That works 2,500 times more than another human being. That is called greed and looting. But no one's mad with the looters of the wealthy, but they'll be mad with Pookie knocking out somebody's window to get a computer. Why are we not upset by the gentrifications of neighborhoods that displace people and cause folk to feel so desperate? Someone told me, Pastor Mike, they can't be looting a Louis Vuitton store. I said, have you met Louis Vuitton? <laughs> Why are you so obsessed with Brother Louis? Is he putting money in your books? Is he putting money in your pocket? Is he helping you to pay your rent? Brother Louis don't care about a store in San Francisco. Why are you willing to put your kid in jail over Brother Louie, who you will never meet? I wish I could talk to somebody. Somebody say, free them all. I want you to understand that the defunding of schools 
is an act of violence. But who's mad about that? I show up to some meetings and they say, Pastor Mike, you two turned up. I said, because I'm upset about violence. I'm not upset about, I mean, I am upset about the violence in the community. That's why we spend much of our time trying to convince Pookie and all the loved ones to not engage in the violence. But who is talking to the wealthy and the powerful who wage violence and then punish the organizers and the freedom fighters who are trying to expose the violence so all of us can always be clear about the conditions in which God has called us to literally work so the kingdom of God can be on earth as it is in heaven. Woo. I'm telling you, we got to share in the suffering. We ain't got to be angry about it, amen, you know. Uh, you know, rage is okay when it's channeled in a righteous way. Somebody say amen. Amen. Scripture says be angry but don't sin. So that just means that there's a role for your anger, but you ought to just make sure your anger is being channeled in a direction that leads to liberation. I want you to... Commit yourself to a liberatory framework as a follower of Jesus. This is what James Cone says. Any theology that is indifferent to the theme of liberation is not Christian theology. Put, 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 put that on the screen so everybody can, can read it for themselves. Because, you know, some people think Pastor Mike just makes stuff up. <laughs> Pastor Mike got too much time on his hands. No, I don't got no time on my hands. I'm just telling you what I've studied and read and what I'm compelled by. We must be willing to unleash the word of God that is not chained, even though we may be chained. And when you unleash the word of God that is not chained, it literally produces liberation for other people. What is the word of God? The word of God is literally God's speech to us, God's command to us that is incarnational. What does it mean to be incarnational? It means that when God inhabited Mary and Mary gave birth to Jesus, it was the incarnation. It was the divine word of God becoming flesh, which is just to say that every work you do in the world ought to have a liberatory result. If you are a follower of Jesus, you may not get arrested. You, I think everybody should get arrested, though. <laughs> I think there's something great about getting arrested for the cause of justice. It does something to you. It puts you in solidarity with Jesus, with the prophets that came before you. It may not feel comfortable, but something happens to you when you know you are doing the right thing so much so that the empire has to try to quell your activity. Woo! Lord, I'm the pastor on one today. Yes, I am. Because I need us to free them all. Somebody say free them all. How then must you prepare yourself to literally be in solidarity with the suffering? You must train for the struggle. Verse number five says, no one, talking about athletes, is declared a winner without competition. How many know there's a competition out here? There's a struggle out here. There's a fight for, for, for the ways of good and righteousness and the ways of wickedness and oppression. And many of us think that the arbitrary struggle is, is not ours to, to literally sign up for. But I want you to know something. That hurricane that's literally coming up the up the up the up the Mexico, Gulf of Mexico, and into California is a result of a literal, a greedy, un, unwilling world to bend our will back to nature and realize that our ways of pollution and, and not taking care of creation, now creation is rising up. Saying to us. You better train yourself because there ain't no nuclear bombs that can stop a hurricane. Hello, somebody. And guess what? The most people impacted by fires and, and, and earthquakes and are the people who literally have little. 
They are the ones living outside. They are the ones without the means, insurance to restart. I was told in Maui that on the aftermath of these fires, developers have already swooped in. Folk are fleeing the country for their life while the wealthy land grabbers are flooding into the country to grab land and turn it into their playground. The same thing happened in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. A city that historically was nothing but a chocolate city now has become somebody else's land. It's happened in East Oakland. It's happened in West Oakland. It is the cycle of us not training ourselves. What do you mean to train yourself? It means you got to figure out how do I do some things to my mind, my body, my soul, and my spirit that makes it sore. Because I'm stretching myself. How many ever, you know, started working out and, you know, you had a whole lot of good intentions? <laughs> they said uh, the, the, the best day of your workout is the first day. Because <laughs> you run, oh, man, I'm, man, these, man, is it, man, I'm ready. And you do your workout, you feel good, you work up a sweat. You know, I didn't know I was this strong. Then you wake up the next day and try to move. <laughs> and your body's like, bruh. <laughs> the hardest day of your workout is the second day. Ain't it something that the easiest day is your first day? The hardest day is your second day. Why? Because the training needed to discipline ourselves. Often, if it's done well, it will stretch you beyond your current capacity. How many of you know we must train ourselves to compete in a world that is literally devising new schemes to rob us of safety, of knowledge, of personhood? And if the church is not ready for that struggle, what I fear happens to the church is that we get seduced by the well-trained antagonists who speak the same words as us, but mean something totally different. Amen. I love Jesus. And they say, oh, I love Jesus too. But I say, which Jesus are you talking about? Because <laughs> I don't love the chain enslaving whipping Jesus that you would sing worship songs to in the morning and then come out and lynch us in the afternoon. I don't love that Jesus. Matter of fact, I don't even think that Jesus exists. You created a Jesus in your own image. I love the Jesus who's about liberation and freedom, who's about healing, who's about salvation, who's about holiness and righteousness and justice and love and peace. How can you say you love Jesus who is a peacemaker and you are a warmongerer? Someone told me, oh, Pastor Mike, but I got to be, I got to, I got to, I got I to gotta be, I, I got to be, you know, obedient to my theology and the scriptures. I say, but understand, beloved, Lord, I'm going long. Understand, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to sit on a panel a couple weeks about this with some other, you know, Christian people, and they're going to ask me all these questions about all kind of things. And I'm going to tell them something like this. I grew up in a church. It was a holiness, apostolic, Pentecostal church. I mean, we're, we are a product of that church, but our church is very different in our emphasis in certain matters. But our old school church, we were taught that only we were going to heaven. Pretty much because of certain doctrinal commitments. If you didn't speak in tongues, didn't baptize Jesus' name, you know, I don't know, you taking a risk. And it was interesting because even other folk who were Pentecostal, but maybe not holiness or baptize Jesus' name, we were kind of suspicious about their chance of making it in heaven. So I'm going to tell these folks, listen. I grew up in a church where many of y'all in this room, not us in this room, but in this meeting I'm going to be at, y'all making it into heaven was a risky proposition. 
That was my doctrinal commitments. And what I've come to realize over the course of my Christian journey is that you can have your personal doctrinal positions, but I'm more worried about your ethics. What does it mean for you to believe what you believe, but have an ethical framework that does no harm to people who may not share your belief? What does it mean for you and I to live in such a way where we can say, I believe this and I'm convinced of it, but I am so convinced of my belief that I'm not going to harm you. Ethics are what is needed in any conversation about faithful Christianity in a multi-religious, multicultural context. Because just like I couldn't get all the Christians to agree on anything, how am I going to get the non-Christians to agree? And if they don't agree, what is my plan to make them agree? Am I going to use the power of the state to put people in jail? Because they don't agree with my way of thinking? Or am I going to say to myself, it is not my job to literally police Everyone I don't agree with, what I'm called to do is literally be in solidarity with the suffering. Train myself to be in a space where, listen, I can, in verse number nine says, use what I have to ensure that the word of God is not chained. How do I ensure the word of God is not chained? Your words and speech can ensure God's word is not chained. You can use words of affirmation. You can pray prayers. You can read texts that ensure that your frame of reference through God's word is literally ensuring that people bound in chains can be set free. Have you ever had such powerful conversations with folk That after your conversation, you can tell they have been set free from bondage. Have you read texts that after you've read them texts, you have felt your spirit, your mind, your soul be set free from? Have you prayed prayers that have caused literal chains to fall from the hearts, the minds, the eyes? The way we free them all through the tools we have is to use our words. Your actions and behaviors. Have you ever taken an act that has caused liberation to spring up in the midst of your context? Have you found on your job spaces, actions, behaviors that you can take that can ensure that bondage is not reinscribed for those who are vulnerable, who are on the margins? Have you asked yourself what resources and gifts you have? Money, talents, intellect, tools, genius, ingenuity. God has given you tools that can be used to ensure that the word of God is not changed. And I want you to know, beloved, that now is the time for we to be people who are on the right side of this conversation related to freedom and justice. I never want to know that in the history when it's written that there were more Christians, followers of Jesus, people of the way who are standing out calling for more punishment rather than healing. I want you to be someone who in every contest can find a way to figure out, can I bring healing into this situation, even though others are calling for more harm? I know they did something foul. I know they may have stepped outside. I know that they went further than perhaps you were willing to go. But can you imagine that God is calling you to be someone to advocate for them, even when they can't advocate for themselves? 
And if you and I can be people who are able to say that beyond a shadow of a doubt, I believe that who the Son has set free is free indeed. And I don't have to wait for the chains to fall even off of my own life before I start to realize that God has given me liberation. It is your birthright. It is that thing that you have inherited. And anyone who tries to put you in chains, well, they're going to find out after a while that you got some extra power that will help you bust through those chains. Uh, one of my favorite cartoons back in the day uh, was Popeye. Uh, anybody remember Popeye? Uh, Popeye was someone who was love struck uh, by what was her name? Olive oil? What was her name? Uh, whatever her name was. Uh, 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 interesting looking person. Mm-hmm. But you, you, you can't control who you love. Somebody tell your neighbor that. Uh, I can't control who I love. Uh, if it's good to me, it's just good to me. Uh, anybody know love will make you do some strange things? Uh, I'll preach on that maybe on Valentine's Day. Uh, but Popeye, uh, Popeye, he, he always was, was trying to figure out how to make sure he was not vulnerable to Brutai or Brutus, whatever his name was. Uh, as you can see, I ain't seen this thing in a long time. Uh, but the thing that stuck with me always uh, was when Popeye was getting his head cracked uh, by Brutus or Brutai, whatever his name was. Uh, there was a little thing called spinach. Uh, and whenever he was overmatched uh, and whenever he was overwhelmed, uh, all he needed was to squeeze a can. Uh, and guess what? The spinach always found its way uh huh. He could be it over here. Uh, he could be it back here. Uh, he could be it out here. But just to squeeze, uh, I dare you to squeeze uh, on the power of liberation uh, and the Holy Spirit that is within you. Because uh, if you can just struggle, Lord, I feel like preaching today. Uh, I don't even got no help, uh, but I'm going to preach anyway. Uh, give your neighbor a high five and tell him squeeze. Uh, squeeze on your spirit. Uh, I I guarantee you, spinach, uh, anointing, uh, power will find its way into your system and every work of the enemy that tries to rise against you you will have the power to defeat that said enemy I want you to be someone who says no matter where I am I may be in the academy I may be on the street corner I may be in my neighborhood I may be in the jailhouse but I serve a God that has declared that we must free them all. Uh, free them from the bondage of their mind. Uh, free them from the chains of their body. Uh, free them from the despair of their heart. Uh, free them all uh, until the doors swing open. Uh, until the oppressed walk out. Uh, until the incarcerated are free. Uh, free them all uh, until the child of God uh, has the power to see those things uh, that are not uh, as though they are. Uh, free them all until God gets the glory until God gets the honor until God gets the praise free them all listen because when they get set free we get set free do you want your freedom today? We can't be free if they ain't free. So child of God, if you got a family member who's incarcerated, don't talk to them or you, me about what they did. Every time you talk to them, let's talk about your freedom. Let's talk about how we gonna get you free. Let's talk about how we gonna help your imagination. I love how we said it on the panel. I think Dr. Davis said it, that the best place for New ideas to emerge are when people are bound in small places. Because the only thing you got left that's not chained is your mind. Woo! I wonder how many of us, come on, stand. Yo, if y'all don't stand, I'm going to keep preaching. I wonder how many of us are stuck in confined spaces and we feel like we have no options. But you do the word of God. It's not chained. 
And guess what? The word of God is in you. So even though you may find yourself locked in a place of depression, despair, pain, rejection, isolation, God always emerges imagination, possibility, the spirit to create the conditions for freedom and liberation. Grab the hand of someone next to you. Let's just pray real quick, real quick, real quick. Sorry, my 20 minutes, it just turned into 40. When I start talking about freedom and liberation, I lose track of time. But as you hold the person next to you, their hand, or touch their shoulder, or just make contact with them in a respectful and consensual manner, praise God. I want you to ask God to unleash in them the gospel that is not chained. The good news that is not chained. Their healing is not chained. They may be in a desperate situation, but guess what? That situation does not cause them or force them to be in chains. So God, I gently squeeze their hand. And into their hands, I squeeze power and strength. I squeeze healing. I squeeze hope. I squeeze possibility. I squeeze courage. I squeeze boldness. I squeeze, God, imagination. New eyes. Give them new eyes. New ears. Give them new ears. New mouths. Give them new mouths. A new mind. Give them a new mind. So they, God, can be a tool to free them all. Free those in their family. Free those in their neighborhood. Free those that they're in relationship with. Free them, God, to go to therapy. Free them, God, to take care of their body. Free them, God, to attend to their relationships. Free them to... Love their children. Free them, oh God, to embrace the brokenhearted. Free them so they will not be locked in the bondage of this corrupt, wicked society that will wage violence and then cause the responders to be the violent. I pray, God, that we will free them all. Now lift your hands right where you're standing. It's me, oh Lord. I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It's not my father. It's not my sister. It's not my brother. But it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, God. I need your strength. I need your hope. I need your peace. I need your love. I need you to infuse me with what I need for this next journey and assignment. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to share in the suffering, to be in solidarity. Thank you, God, for the opportunity, oh God. To train my body, my mind, my spirit, my soul for the struggle. Thank you for another opportunity, God, to use the tools that I have. I pray, God, that you will make me your instrument of healing in the world, of restoration. And do it in Jesus' name we pray. Give two or three people a high five or a hug or elbow bump and tell them, free them all. Free them all. Free them all. Bless you. Bless you. Give the Lord a hand.